men. How about 2 Corinthians 11, Revelation 4, Revelation 5, Isaiah 11, Revelation, no, we'll do it one by one, item by item. Amen. Well, I'll tell you what, I feel like I've been in the wilderness all week because we didn't have church Wednesday night. Didn't it feel strange? Several years ago when I was uh, pastoring out at Richwoods, that, that's a long drive from my house and over the river and through the woods, literally. And there was one particular winter, um, we got, I don't know, about five or six inches of sleet. Do you remember that? I mean, just sleet just piled up everywhere on all the roads. And so that came in on a Saturday, Saturday night, so we had to cancel church the next day. And so we sat around, and I said, Lisa, I said, that just doesn't feel right, us being at home, not being in church, you know. So the next Saturday, we got it again. It's almost like they were checking the calendar to make sure they could fit this in, you know, right before church. So two Sundays in a row, we didn't have church. And the, that second Sunday, it got easier to just sit at home and not do anything. And I went, I didn't like that. So, the next weekend, they're calling for more sleep. Kid you not. And the church out there, they had a house next door, kind of like we do. And I told Lisa, I said, you stay here with the girls. Matthew wasn't born yet. I said, I'm going to drive out there and spend the night. We're having church. I don't care if it's just me and three other people staring at me. We're having church. And so... I drove out there and, and uh, was going to stay the night in that house, and the deacon came down and turned the heat on for me, his gas heat and all that. So, man, I'm ready to go. When I woke up at 5.30 the next morning, the furnace had blown out. Hot water heater wasn't on. So I'm waking up in this house. It's about 40 degrees in there, freezing to death. And... Uh, having to wash down with ice cold water. Needless to say, I was wide awake. And um, the, the storm wasn't as bad as the two previous Sundays, so we had probably 12 people there. But we was glad to be in the house of the Lord. Amen. Second Corinthians 11. And that's what the, the purpose of that story is when you miss church, you feel bad, you feel terrible. Man, I miss church. The second time you miss church, it gets easier. And the third time, fourth time, fifth time, all of a sudden now, you're just not going to church and you don't think nothing of it. That's not a good place to be. 2 Corinthians 11. Would to God you could bear with me a little my folly and indeed bear with me, for I'm jealous over you with godly jealousy, for I've espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. But I fear, lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve, through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ, for if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if ye receive another spirit, which ye have not received, or another gospel, which ye have not accepted, ye might well bear with him. So, what we're going to do this morning is we're going to look at uh, the Holy Spirit uh, in the light or in the context of its representation or its connection with your Bible, the Word of God. In days gone by, you almost didn't need to teach something like this because everybody believed that if you're a Christian, you read the Bible and you believe the Bible. Nowadays, not so much anymore. Okay? You can have an experience with God or you can have a, an experience, some sort of ecstatic experience, an emotional experience with what they say is the Holy Ghost, but... It excludes the Bible, or it can be given outside of the Word of God. In other words, you don't need a Bible anymore in, in modern thought. You don't need a Bible anymore to have a revelation or to have an experience with the Holy Spirit. And what's happened is a lot of people have traded off. And this is not just limited to those of a, let's say, a Pentecostal or a charismatic persuasion. 
There, the idea is you can have an emotional experience, some sort of emotional lift, or the, the church service can be like, a, like an emotional lift to you. It can be like a pep rally, you know, before a, <laughs> before a basketball game or something like that. And they say that's the evidence of the Spirit, but it's not, it's not related nor attached to anything tangible inside of the Bible. So we've, we've replaced, in a lot of churches, they've replaced emotionalism with the real Spirit of God. Now, I'm not against emotions. I have several of my own. Okay? I don't mind getting a little happy in the Lord. I don't mind getting excited. I don't mind, uh, uh, let's say, maybe um, in, in, as I'm worshiping God, I feel very strong emotions. But I've learned over the years not to trust my emotions. My emotions do not dictate to me what it is that I believe or what it is I stand for. And that's the key. We had a, a young lady that I grew up with here in this church. I knew she was taught right. She was taught the same things I was. And she got uh, hooked in by a, a family member. It was her sister-in-law. And um, got, got swung into this charismatic church. And all of a sudden, she's now having these experiences, and she's speaking in unknown tongues, and this and that and the other. And I, I questioned her. I said, listen, I love you. I've known you all my life. I care about you. But what is it from the Bible that makes what you did right? Can you show me in the Bible where this is from? And she admitted to me, no, I can't. She said, now my preacher, he's better at this than I am. And I said, but... If what you say comes from the Holy Ghost, then we ought to be able to read it right here in the book. And she says, I don't know about that. What I know is, I know what I felt, and I know it felt right. Therefore, this is, this is the way I'm going. Never could, never could convince her that it should be in the Word of God. So this is what we're going to do. Turn to Revelation chapter 4. Revelation chapter 4. Here John is getting a, um, a vision of the throne of God. Um, if you want to do a study and compare Revelation 4 to Ezekiel 1, you'll see the similarities. You'll see uh, the throne, you'll see the, the uh, firmament or like a sea of glass that the throne uh, sits on. Then you'll see in Ezekiel, you'll see the four living creatures. In Revelation 4, he call, refers to them as four beasts. Okay? One, one word is as the other. There's not, a, there's not a difference between them. And this is what John saw. In, uh, in fact, let me read, let's read uh, down, starting with verse 1. After this, I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was, as it were, of a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. And immediately I was in the Spirit. And behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. Who is that? Jesus. Um, or you could say, there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are, because that's what you, you have the number one in verse two. One sat on the throne, and he that sat was to look upon like a jasper and a sardine stone, and there was a rainbow round about the throne in sight like unto an emerald. Well, if you go back to Ezekiel one, Ezekiel saw that, and he said, um, uh, the, as the likeness of a bow that's in the cloud in the day of rain, this was the likeness of the glory of the Lord. And I like that. Rainbow is indicative of God's promise. That's what he said in Genesis chapter 9. He said, when I bring the cloud over the land, I do set my bow in the cloud as a token of my covenant with you. That bow is the glory of the Lord, that rainbow and it's a representation of Jesus Christ. Because Jesus comes, whenever you see the clouds, look in the clouds. Amen? He's going to be in the clouds. A rainbow has how many different colors to it? Seven. Now here's, what's, I, here's something I never figure out. You have like blue and red and yellow and you have all those different colors in there. And separately, they're, they're each their own color. But somehow, when you combine those seven colors together, you get white. You get light. Now, I may be wrong, but if I remember from my days when I had a Crayola box about that big, 
with 64 colors in it and a built-in sharpener on the back. When I combined seven colors, they never came out white. Amen? When I came in from playing in the yard with seven different colors on my britches, they never turned out white. Amen? But for some reason, these seven come out light. They come out the color of white. But anyway, uh, and then uh, verse uh, 5. Um, now, let's sit down. Let me read verse 4. Uh, round about the throne were four and twenty seats, and upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders sitting, clothed in white raiment, and they had on their heads crowns of gold. <clears throat> in verse 5, And out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices. And there were, and notice three things here, lightnings, thunderings, and voices. It's because you have a thrice holy God sitting on that throne, and the things about him usually represent the number three, or, or is a representation of what the number three means. So in verse 5, you have uh, lightning, thunderings, and voices. And there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. So, how, can, how is it that we can discern whether something is of the Holy Spirit of God, or it is a like a lying spirit, or um, a, dis, uh, how did Paul put it? Um, doctrines of devils, huh? Seducing spirits. That's the words I was looking for. Seducing spirits, doctrines of devils. How can we tell and how can we discern whether or not a spirit that is present, let's say it's manifesting in our life or it's manifesting in somebody else's life or a church uh, or anything like that, how can we discern whether or not it is of the Spirit of God? So we have those seven. Seven is the number four what? Perfection? Completion? Huh? Purity, holiness. And all of that you can get from Genesis chapter 2. When God blessed the seventh day, he hallowed it, which means he made that day holy. He sanctified it, which means that day is to be a pure day. Talking about the seventh day. Um, then somebody would say, well, how come we don't go to church on Saturday or the Sabbath day? Bible doesn't tell us we have to. Does not tell us we have to go and congregate at church or at a synagogue only on the seventh day or on the seventh day or no other day than the seventh day. Does not tell us that. Uh, the Bible does not tell us that we have to gather together on the first day of the week. Does not tell us that. We do. And I woke up this morning with that thought in mind. You know, this is the first day of the week. This day belongs to the Lord. Okay. Seriously, I did wake up that way. I'm not saying I always wake up with such a happy, godly thought in my mind. Okay? Some days it's like, I ain't leaving this bed. I know that. Okay? Um, but anyway, um, what was I saying? God hallowed that day. We, we, we're not under law that tells us we have to go to church on Saturday. The law never says anything about that. We are here not because we have to be. Here because we want to be. Here because we need to be. This is the first day of the week. First things belong to the Lord. Let God have the first day of the week, the first hour of the day, the first fruits of your labor. Let God have, let, let him have your firstborn child, please. <laughs> okay? Let, let God have the first of everything in your life, and then he'll give you everything else, what the Bible says. So anyway, um, he sanctified it. Revelation chapter 3. Turn there. Verse 1. Uh, you might want to jot this down too. The phrase, Holy Spirit. Seven times in the King James Bible. Holy Spirit. Uh, the phrase, Holy Ghost, is 90 times. That's fruit bearing. And you have some people with this ridiculous objection to the King James Bible saying, God's Spirit is not a ghost. Ghosts are evil. And I would say to that, learn English before you go try to learn any other language. English, our words come to us from different languages. Ghost, from like a, a German word, Geist. And it simply means a spirit. It's all it means. Just because Hollywood or just because comic books or whatever 
has turned the word ghost into some sort of evil apparition of somebody dead and so on. Just because somebody has turned that into that does not mean that that is the limit of what that word means. Somebody's going somebody's to hit you with this one these days. Somebody's going to say, well, God's spirit is not a ghost in a white sheet or whatever. The word ghost, look it up. Go to etymology online. Look, type in the word ghost. just means a spirit. That's what it means. Okay? Uh, Revelation 3.1. Under the angel of the church of Sardis write, These things saith he that hath the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know thy works, uh, that thou hast a name, that thou livest and art dead. The seven stars uh, in this instance represent, he said, the seven churches. Uh, and he is, um, when, when John saw Jesus, he saw the, the seven stars, he saw the seven candlesticks. And he said, this, uh, Christ was in the midst of those seven candlesticks. And in the midst, of, let me, in fact, I'm, I'm going to read it wrong, so I better read it right. Hang on a second. Revelation chapter 1. Yeah, verse 12. I turned to see the voice that spake with me, and being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment, down to the foot... And, and gird about the paps with a golden girdle. Now I want you to think about the symbolism here. The seven candlesticks represent what? What did we just say they represent? The seven spirits of God. Okay? So here is Christ in the midst of those candlesticks. Think about what you're seeing here in your mind's eye. You have the seven lights, the seven candles, the seven spirits of God, and they are illuminating who? Christ, the real Jesus. If you want to know Jesus, it's the Spirit that will teach you Jesus. He'll illuminate Christ. He'll show you, and Christ is everything the Bible says He is. He's the Redeemer, He's the Savior, He's the Judge, but He's also the Word of God. So what does that then tell you? you want to, if you want to know the Word of God, the Holy Ghost is there to illuminate God's Word for you. Uh, there's some, what is your bulletin? Look at your bulletin for today. What does that say on there? About the Bible. Does it say something about the Bible is the only book whose author is present? Always. Always present. When you read the Bible, the Holy Ghost is going to give you divine inspiration. Paul said, uh, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. Which means when you're reading your Bible, the Holy Ghost is breathing life into your soul. You need that life in you. Amen? You need that spirit. You need that illumination in you. And John 16, Jesus is teaching us about the Comforter. And he said, he will speak of me. He will not speak of himself. The Holy Ghost does not shed light on or put the spotlight on, per se, the Holy Ghost or himself. His, his nature and, his, and uh, his character is that he illuminates Jesus Christ. He illuminates the Word of God. And there's no, no reason why God's people should continue on in ignorance when you have the light of the world right there in the palm of your hand. Amen? Amen? You have the Bible. You have, you have, how many has more than one Bible? You own more than one Bible. King James, by the way. Okay. Don't even ask me how many I have. I, have, I got some upstairs. I got them scattered around here. And I got them in my office. I got them, in, got them scattered around at home. But then I got it on my tablet. Got it on my phone. Got it on my computer. The Word of God is always present with me. And there is no reason or excuse that you can come up with why you don't read it. Or why at least you don't listen to it and hear it. Faith cometh by hearing, hear the word, hearing the word of God. But that deal about the seven spirits of God, they're illuminating who Christ is. And he has those seven spirits, all right? Uh, let's see, where was that? That was uh, Revelation chapter 1, verse, uh, verse 13. In verse 14, his head and his hairs were uh, white like wool, white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire, and his feet like unto fine brass as if they burned in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. 
and he had in his right hand seven stars. Now think about that. He said, the seven stars, verse 20, the mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand and the seven golden candlesticks, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches and the seven candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches. Think about it. The seven candlesticks, we know they represent the Holy Spirit, but here he said they also represent the seven churches. Think about it. Here's Christ, and he's in the midst of the seven candlesticks. Jesus said, where two or more are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. Doodads just went up my neck. This Bible's right. Amen? When we open this book up, we come to Sunday school, we open this book up, we're reading it and believing it, the Holy Ghost, Jesus Christ, is right here in this place. It's why we reverence the house of God. It is a holy place. It is a sanctified place. It's not a bingo hall. Amen? It's not a place where we put on theatrical plays. It's not a music hall. It's not anything other than this is a sanctified, set-aside place where when we come in here, we are here to reverence and give glory to the Word of God, Jesus Christ. Amen? No other purpose. Okay? We don't play basketball in here. We don't spill our drinks all over the carpet and all over the pews and put gum under the... We don't do that. Amen? We don't leave our candy wrappers laying in the pew. Amen? Now that I got you to say amen, I'm going to have Lindsay write down every pew that she finds candy wrappers in. She gonna, she's not going to give it to me. She's going to post it out here as you walk in the door with a security camera footage of you going like that. I'm just kidding. Uh, turn to Revela or Isaiah 11. Here's your seven spirits of God. They are uh, understanding... The, uh, the nature of the seven spirits is sort of like understanding the Godhead. Christ is different than the Father. The Holy Spirit is different than Christ and the Father. They are unique, and yet they are one God. We don't worship three gods. Okay? I had, I just I had some of the stupidest dreams in my life last night. And I just remembered this. I dreamt that I was, I was back in high school. It was the 80s. And Finnis Date was here at this church. And somebody said, Hey, Finnis Date is here. Do you want to go meet him? I, yes, I do. And I walked over to him. He stuck his hand out. And I said, You're a liar. Just like that. I mean, you're a liar and a wolf in sheep's clothing. Where, I'm going, Lord, where in the world did that come from? Let me tell you why I brought that up, okay? Finnis Date believed, and if you would accuse him of it, he'd, he'd deny it. But he believed that the Godhead was not, in fact, one God. He said they are one only in purpose, but they're not one like you would think there's one person there. He said, the Bible doesn't mean that at all. And I'm going, but the Bible says it. These three are one. Now, just because I can't add that up mathematically does not negate it, and it does not mean that it doesn't mean that. Okay? What he believed was that each member of the Godhead had his own spirit, soul, and body. So with God... The Father, he had his own spirit, his own soul, and his own body. Christ had his own spirit, soul, and body. And the Holy Spirit had his own spirit, soul, and body. And I'm going, let's see, that's nine. Right? Three times three is nine. And that's, as he said it in his writings. He said it in the Dake Annotated Bible, which if you have one, throw it away. Get rid of it. Do not read Dake's notes. They're confusing. Okay? But that's what he believed. And he is like the... I want to say grandfather, but it's more like the godfather of all this charismatic wackiness that you see in this world 
A lot of it originated from him. He had, this, he had a lot of messed up ideas, including his messed up idea about the Godhead. He's lying through his teeth. He said, well, the Bible says that in all these verses. And I read the verses. It doesn't say that. Anyway, so how do we understand that God is three and yet he's one? You may not understand it, but you believe it. You don't have the Bible telling you anything different. It just is that way. It's sort of like the seven spirits of God. How can we believe that the Holy Spirit is one entity and yet there are seven spirits? Just believe it. That's what the Bible says. When we get to heaven, you can sit and ask God all these questions all you want to and he'll give you the answer. And you'll go, why didn't I know that on earth? Because your brain was only like this big. Okay, Isaiah 11, verse 1. There shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse and a branch shall grow out of his roots. That's Christ. Christ came from the lineage of David from Jesse. Jesse was David's father. Uh, then verse 2. And the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. That is the first Spirit of God. Okay? The Spirit of the Lord, number one. And so what is the significance of that? Number one, that tells you what the Holy Ghost will reveal to you what God's name is. Because in that verse, you have Lord all in capital letters. What does that designate or what does that show? Anybody? Huh? That's his name. Okay, it's showing you that in the Hebrew, the, the letters are yod He bah He. There's four letters in that. And what is, when you see capital L-O-R-D in all capital letters, that's telling you that the Hebrew there is God's literal name, yod He bah He. The pronunciation of that, according to the Bible, is Jehovah. I don't have anything to prove otherwise. Amen? I just have my Bible tell me it's Jehovah. Okay? Now, what gave the King James translators the right to write his name down as Lord when in the Hebrew it was yod heh vah -Hey, Jehovah? What gave them the right to give God that name of Lord? Because there are those who argue, well, Lord's not a name. Yeah, it is. Does anybody know? Okay, write this down. You're going to need this. Okay? Every, uh, in fact, let me show it. I'll do it by way of observation. Turn to Isaiah 61. Isaiah 61. And hold your place there and then turn to Luke 4. And hold your place there. Luke chapter 4. Let's say verses 18 and 19. If you look in Luke chapter 4, 18 and 19. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted. To preach deliverance to the captives. And recovery of sight to the blind. To set at liberty them that are bruised. And then verse 19. To preach the acceptable year of the Lord. Okay, now hold your hand there and flip over to Isaiah 61. <coughs> Look at verse 1. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord... Now stop right there. Uh, let's see here. Okay, it does it. Look at verse, uh, verse 2. To proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Now notice in your Bible, Isaiah 61, 2, the word is all capital letters, L-O-R-D. Okay? Well, what that means is that in the Hebrew, it's yod heh vah -Hey, or Jehovah. Okay? Does everybody see that? Right. Now look, at, look back at Luke 4, verse 19, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. Okay? Now, here's what I'm, here's what I'm trying to get at. Um, you don't have to know Greek and Hebrew, but you do have to believe the Bible. Okay? In the Greek, the word Lord is Kyrios. Um, you ever heard of a curator? Someone who is a curator of a museum. What does that mean? They're the boss of the museum. They're the ones who are in control. The, the, so that's where we get the word curators from the Greek word Kyrios, which means Lord. So, when Luke was writing this verse out, he wrote it in Greek. 
and he used the word Kyrios in Greek, which means Lord. Back here in Isaiah 61, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord, the Hebrew is God's name, Jehovah. So, if anybody, people will bring this up because they don't like the King James Bible. They will say, well, if the King James is so good, how come they took God's name out over 6,000 times and replaced it with something else? They didn't. The translators knew that every place in the New Testament where they were quoting an Old Testament verse like Isaiah 61 2, that every place the word, how can I say this? Every place in the New Testament where they're quoting the Old Testament, they use the word Kyrios or Lord. The Holy Ghost gave that word to these men as they wrote that down. Gave it to Mark, gave it to Luke, gave it to Paul. Paul quoted from the Old Testament all the time and he never wrote down God's name in Greek or Jehovah or anything like that. He wrote Lord, meaning the Holy Ghost is the one who gave that name to God from the Old Testament. So every time you see the word Lord in the Old Testament, all capital letters, that is the absolute correct translation. There is no other alternative because then it would violate every place in the New Testament where it's translated Lord. Does that, does that make sense to everybody? Okay? And there is no exception to that. You will not find um, the word Jehovah or the equivalent of yod heh vah -Heh anywhere in the Greek. You don't find that there. You find the word Lord in Greek. So the translators did the right thing. Amen? Okay, they did the right thing. Anyway, let's bring this back together now. So, number one, the first spirit is the Spirit of the Lord, and it's the Holy Ghost that will teach you that God not only is Lord, but His name is the Lord. Think about it. God's name is the Lord. Not only is it His name, it is His title, it is His designation, and what it means is that if you have the Holy Spirit really in your life, you'll do what the Lord tells you to do. Okay? That's the first spirit. Second spirit. Uh, the, the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. And here, I like this. I like these little subtle nuances in the, in the Bible. The spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. If you go read um, where Jesus came up out of the water after being baptized, the Bible says the spirit descended as a dove and rested upon him. Exactly what... Isaiah said was going to happen. It rested upon him, lit upon his shoulder. Rest upon him. Number two, the spirit of wisdom. Who in here needs wisdom? Okay? Wisdom does not come from self-help manuals, does not come from watching TV, does not come from sitting watching YouTube videos all day long. Wisdom comes from the knowledge of the Word of God, the understanding of the Word of God. It comes from the Word of God. Number two. Number three, understanding. When you're reading the Bible and you don't understand something, what do you do? Huh? Wait on... Okay. Huh? Okay. Wait on the Lord, look around, study it out. Okay. Huh? Ask the Lord for wisdom. He gives it liberally. It's the only place in the Bible that says God's a liberal. It's in the book of James. If any man lacketh wisdom, ask of the Lord. He'll give, give it wit liberally to you. Uh, spirit of wisdom. Spirit of understanding. Uh, that's, let's see. Spirit of the Lord. Spirit of wisdom. Spirit of understanding. Spirit of counsel. That's the fourth one. Uh, in Isaiah, um, Isaiah 9, where it talks about uh, the Lord for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor. When you need help, when you need counseling, when you need wisdom, when you need, you're going through a rough deal in your life, you don't know, and you come to a place where you've got to make a choice, you've got to make a decision. What decision should you make? Ask the Lord. Now I get, I mean, I get emails, I get messages, I get phone calls, I mean, all week long. 
I try to help as many as I can. But it would be wrong for me, let's say if, if Todd had something in his mind and he just, he's trying to make a decision on something or whatever, and he comes to me and says, Pastor, I mean, I, I don't know what to do about this situation. You know, I, I'm not sure exactly what to do. Well, come to my office. And we'll, we'll do counseling from 11 till noon. And that's only, you know, $40 for the first hour, you know, $60 after that per hour. You can come to me for counseling. It would be wrong for me to sit and talk to you for an hour and never bring the Bible up. I don't have any wisdom. Those of you who know me know that. Okay? I make very foolish, dumb mistakes. I usually end up hurting myself in the process. The only wisdom and the only counsel that I can give you is to be able to know what Bible verses would apply in your particular situation and say, Here, this is what saith the Lord. This is what the Bible says to do. And it's your choice to do it. But you came for counseling. I'm going to give you counseling. Here's the counsel of the Lord. By the way, that's a state, I think that's a phrase in the counsel of the Lord or the counsel, something like that. Maybe you can look that up. The spirit of counsel, the spirit of might. Might means like mighty, powerful. You have the power to stand against your enemies. God gives you that power and he gives you that might. The spirit of knowledge, which means you read the Bible and retain the facts that you're getting from the Bible. Um, who can, by memory, tell me how long the ark of Noah was? Just by memory. Huh? 150 foot? How long it was? 300 cubits. Okay? Now, 300 cubits, uh-huh. Let's look. Let's look. God be true in every Michael liar. Hang on, I'm not done. Genesis 6. Uh, this is the fashion which thou shalt make of it. The length of the ark shall be 300 cubits. The breadth of it 50 cubits. The height of 30 cubits. Now, why is that important? Be honest with you, I don't have a clue. But it's in the Bible. Okay, it's in the Bible. Um, who was the grandfather of King David? Anybody know? Obed. Yeah, it was Ruth and Boaz gave, gave birth to Obed, who gave birth to Jesse, gave birth to David. Now, again, why is this important? Some people will question that. Well, you know, things like that, they're not important. They're in the Bible. Some reason God has for putting that in the Bible. If I were you, I would know that. You just don't know what deceptions the devil is planning. But he's like a, he's like a football team. He'll send a scout out to learn the other football team's weaknesses. You know what he's going to learn? He's going to try to figure out what they don't know. And what they don't know, he'll use that somehow, some way to deceive people. Because the Bible says that the devil is wiser than Daniel. It's not his first day around the block, people. He's been doing this and deceiving people for thousands of years. He's pretty good at it. But he always looks for leverage. He always looks for something that you don't know. Now... There may be things more important in this Bible that probably you should know, you should learn. But the truth of it is, how can you expect to have wisdom from the Bible when you don't know the Bible? Know the Bible and know how it speaks and know the things that you believe enough so that when somebody says something, you may not be able to quote chapter and verse against it, but you know that that doesn't sound right according to what you know about the Bible. And I've had many instances of that. I had a guy come in, Michael will tell you, scared us to death. This guy was big, big old brawny looking dude, homeless guy living out of his car. And he wanted to keep, he wanted to bring his computer in here and hook it up to our network. And I said, you're not bringing that in here. He said, I got stuff to show you on here. I said, just give me the gist of it. 
So he rattled off something, and I went, hold on. I don't remember what it was, but I said, hold on a second. So let me make sure I understand you right. And I reiterated it back to him, and he said, yeah. I said, I can stop you right there and tell you that that disagrees with the Word of God. Now, I don't remember what it was, but I read him the verses, and I said, I can't listen. If that's the foundation of what you're believing, I can't build anything on top of that because what you're saying to me is not right. And again... I mean, you may not be able to quote chapter and verse all the time, but at least you know the Bible well enough to know when you're being lied to. Yeah. Amen. Amen? Amen? So that's the spirit of knowledge. And then the last one is the fear of the Lord. Now, reconcile this with me. Paul said in the New Testament, For God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and a sound mind. How then, if God's not given us the spirit of fear, how then can we have the spirit of the fear of the Lord? Huh? Reverence. The reverence of the Lord. Okay. Let me, let me see if I can clarify this. While you don't have to be afraid of what the devil can do to you, you should be very afraid of what God can do to you. Just like you were afraid, Ryan, of your mama finding out some things. Right, mama? Don't let mama find out. She'll get you and you know it. Right, Melissa? I'm not even going to begin to tell you stories on my sister. I'm telling you right now. By the way, verse 2, there's 33 words in your King James Bible, verse 2, that describe Jesus and the seven spirits of God. 33 words. The Bible's right, amen? amen? So, take that then, as, we, as you think about the Spirit of God. If the Spirit is not manifesting one or several of these things mentioned here, then there's a good clue you don't have the Spirit of God. So let me give you this, and we're going we're gonna to pray. So, all of a sudden... Wayne burst out speaking in tongues in church one day. Go. See, he's good at that. What did he just say? Anybody know? Wayne himself doesn't even know what he said. As I look at these seven spirits, I don't see anything here about the spirit of unknown things. The Spirit of God is knowledge and understanding and counsel and wisdom. Things that are seen, things that are understood, things that are plain, not things that are confusion. We do not believe that God's Spirit creates chaos and confusion in His house. We don't believe that. So that, that's a clue there. Anything that violates these seven spirits get it out. It's not the Spirit of God. Amen? Yes. Father in heaven, Lord, thank you for the knowledge of this book. Thank you, Lord, for what it says. Thank you, Lord, for giving us time throughout our day to read it. And Lord, just challenge our hearts and encourage us, Lord, to read, to study, to meditate, to think on these things. God, fill us full of knowledge of the Word of God, knowledge of what it says, knowledge of who you are, knowledge of Christ, knowledge of the Spirit. Give us discernment of spirits from the knowledge that you've given to us from your word. Father, just impart to your church the seven spirits of God, Lord, that we be wise, that we know things. When lost people come to us seeking answers, we know the answers because they're in the word of God. Father, bless your word. Bless in the hearts of these people, we pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen.